So the, the barons and the black barons both played here. And that's not unusual in, um, during minor league, Negro league era. So Bull Connor started here. He got the name Bull from using the old bullhorn. He was the field announcer. And, uh, <clears throat> but he became the head of the uh, Public Safety Commission, is what they called it. And so it was the Public Safety Commission who developed these rules. They weren't actually laws. They were just made by the Public Safety Commission and then treated as law. But one of them was that you could not have white and black people of any age playing on a sports field together. That went from kindergarten through professional sports. Because it wasn't safe. But, but well, <laughs> according to him, I guess. Wow. Um, but it was, yeah, that was part of, that was in the interest of public safety, the way it was phrased. And so, uh, you know, there was little league teams that had crosses burned on their field. Um, you know, anything that, any time that uh, uh, white and blacks would end up on the field, they would, you know, people would end up in jail if it happened. The, in about 62, um, the, the Negro Leagues, which is what they're called, I mean, I'm not, you know, that's, right. that's still the, that's the what term. They're... Uh, they had begun to desegregate themselves. They were never officially segregated, and there was all through time, there was occasionally um, white or uh, Latino players and things like that. It was, you know, they weren't, they didn't have an issue rule. But uh, the, with the arrival of Jackie Robinson into the majors, immediately their top talent of the Negro Leagues began going to the major leagues. And so, in so doing, it, you know, the, the uh, Negro Leagues began to suffer attendance, etc. cetera, immediately. And so by about 61, 62, they're looking for any way to get people to come, and they need players. So they'll have white players on teams. One came from Texas here, had uh, two white players, and they tried to take the field, and the sheriff shows up. He's like, you're not allowed. It's against the law in Birmingham. And they were forced to take off their uniforms and sit in the stands while the game went on. They weren't allowed to play. And so we got here. All right, this is the edge of the grandstand. Right here, Orange cone is the unit. So they basically were the same height as the grandstand. And they extended over not all the way to that light fixture, but about three quarters of the way there. And they came back about as far as the grandstands. And so my uh, primary excavation unit is right there. And of course, it's filled back in. And like I said, I have to fill it in. And that's where I'm hanging. I've got another one over there. Now this gate that we're at, this is where the African American during the White Barons game. This is where the African American uh, fans had to come. Come from. in. They had to park here, where we parked is the the park parking, except unless you were black, I and mean, you had to park here. And then you had to come through this gate, so you never cross path right. with the you know, the white for public safety. And <clears throat> there was chicken wire that separated the bleachers from the grandstands. The, I don't, I'm not sure where the restrooms were. It's, it's a question. <laughs> the need for the afternoon. It is a ballot question. So this wooden fence was put in and um, about 30 something. So this concrete fence had, had, this was the original fence back here, was wood, 1910. Tornado came through and knocked it down a couple times, so they made a concrete fence. But then, baseball itself changed with Babe Ruth, 
and people expected home runs. Well, this thing is a massive distance back. This concrete fence, 480 feet to center. That's huge. That's, I mean, that's bigger, far bigger than any major league park today. There, it's so big that there's a sign, uh, a plaque with an X on it, where Walt Droppo hit the the wall during a game. Not even over the wall, <laughs> where he hit the freaking wall. And so this concrete fence was there, and by uh, 27, I think by 27 they built it when they built the other stuff. And then a few years later, uh, they were like, oh, well, nobody can hit it out of here. It's too big a park. So they built this wooden fence. Well, part of what it did was preserve this area in between um, and help ensure where the bleachers were has been preserved. So I have a, archaeologically, it's a great situation. You know, it, it, it provides uh, an opportunity that normally wouldn't have, you know, and it doesn't interfere, my excavations don't, they don't interfere with the ball game, the play, and that's a, that's to an advantage, otherwise I probably wouldn't, wouldn't be able, be able to, dig. to dig. Yeah. And uh, so, <clears throat> the, you can imagine that, you know, it was the big deal, and we have to so this was a rail yard too. The railroad here before it was a ballpark was a rail. So the ra yard. yeah, the ra I was going to ask that. Has the rail yard always been there? Mm -hmm. And uh, so. So this the their stand wasn't that big. If they only had this small area to park in. Right, that was it. Now when it. the right. Black Barons played, they were in all the seats. So okay. they sat everywhere. They but could they the could sit everywhere. Games, it was just here. just here, and they had the. Here. And I'm not sure the number of seats that were possible in the bleachers, but it couldn't have been more than about 800 at the very most. Um, and that would be pushing the problem. But uh, they would, um, they could pull, you know, around, but it wasn't, you know, it was still restricted, you know, more of the segregation and restriction than where, you know, you're, you're reminded at every turn that you have a lower, you know, place in society. And the the fact is that you couldn't even go to use the restrooms where other people did, you know. You couldn't go to the concessions that other people did. When did they take the stands down? So, 1964, see segregation. Mm -hmm. by, by 1970, they're down. I haven't actually figured out which year yet because I don't have any photos and it wasn't something that was really recorded. Right. Um, and the girl, I met uh, a woman whose dad had been the, the GM for the Barons and through all those years and, but she just recently had had a, went through and sold off almost all his papers and everything. So oh, no. the one rec one place where the records were, I don't know where they are anymore. So that kind of sucks. But uh, so some, but I know by 1970 they're down, and it, it is a uh, really not that big a deal. What year, you know? It, it uh, uh, doesn't matter that much in a sense, you know, as long as I know about when they're down. But they were, uh, the, it's the formality of it that's, that's even amazing, you know, how it was set aside, you know, even these years ago. And that, that's, it's not solely an Alabama phenomenon, but you, I find this in other uh, areas too. So working for, doing some work for Alabama Power on historic, these dam villages that were built when they put in the hydroelectric dam. So, the first one was put in in 19, well, it was built between 1912 and 14, and then 1920s. And the ones, first one I worked on was that first one. Now working on the 1924 one. And, you know, they have set aside formal, you know, the African American labor camp and things. And they, at the, at the one working one now called Lake Mitchell, they actually built a nine-foot fence around that, around the African-American labor camp. And it was like for their protection, 
you know, <laughs> and put the sheriff's office in there. And it was against the rules for any white person to go in there without permission. And it's it's hardly to protect the white, you know. It's it's the, but the language that's used is is that you know it's for their protection. So the houses that they uh, provided for the whites, they provided cottages. They were like they weren't big, but they were like uh, two rooms plus a bathroom and uh, you know, closets and things. So they were they were suitable for a small family. Right. So, for the African American workers, they built a one-room shack for all of them. For the fa- well, for each family, and so that shack was 15 by 18 feet, and that was everything. It was the bed, uh, was stove. Um, things like everything was in there. Uh, so these stands were built out to originally. So grandstands have a roof. That's what makes them grand. Oh. Stands. Okay. And the, originally the grandstands were tucked to where you see the fence on top of the roof there. Uh huh. That's as far as they went on both sides. That 27 expansion brought the grandstands around, built the Jim Crow bleachers. And expand it this way and then there was bleachers on this side too and uh for a long time and so the um park was built by rick woodward and that's the rick wood um name and he was a steel magnate in birmingham very successful and uh very rich and he wanted to be a ball player you know he was Wealthy enough to um, do this, you know, take the, buy the Barrens, build this park. And the park was premier in its day, and it's still a beautiful park. And it was designed in part after Philadelphia Scheib Park, which became Connie Mack Field, and which is gone now. And, uh, but he brought Connie Mack down, who was a very famous baseball guy, he managed the A's and all kinds of things. But, um, but he came down and consulted. Before they were in this park, they played at the Slag Pile. Yeah. <laughs> and the Slag Pile was close to Sloss Furnaces, which is still around as big historic um, steel mill. And it was literally that. It was a clear space surrounded by piles of slag. And that's where they played ball. And people would sit on the, or stand on the piles of slag and watch the game. Huh. And so this was quite a step up from the slide pile. And I, one of the side projects that uh, I'm going to do with uh, a local scholar is we're going to look for that field, the slide pile. So as soon as he found out what I was doing, he was like, oh man, I, I want to do this. Like, okay, well, all right, that's, that's something I wanted to do myself. <laughs>